Alan de Bottom, great to see you. Thank you for coming. Are you happy to count us down? Very happy. From five? From five. Okay. Here we go. Five, four, three, two, one. Despite being known as a popular philosopher, you didn't actually study philosophy at university. That's right. I studied history and focused on the history of ideas. And that was always my passion, how ideas affect uh, how people live. Do you live your life by a philosophy? Not one philosophy. I think it would be very hard nowadays to limit yourself to one person. But I try and pick up insights uh, from a range of thinkers. Do you have a world view? Um, I do. Bits of a world view. Of course, I think all of us do. Um, the work, you know, what separates a writer from somebody else is a writer probably has to articulate that world view, which I try and do in certain areas. But yes, I hope to die with a sort of magnum opus of, you know, outlying all my views on all things, um, insufferable to everybody else, but satisfying for me. Were you interested in ideas from a very early age? Um, not really. I was a disturbed child and adolescent, and I think that's where my interest in ideas comes from. I think that people become intellectual because of disturbance. My goal, raising my own children, is that they will never read a book, or at least not be that dramatically inclined towards writing and reading. Why? Because I think, as I say, that um, reading and writing is a response to anxiety, uh, often having a, a basis in childhood. And um, as I say, I, I hope to at least uh, quench some of that uh, need in, in my children. Is there a therapeutic element to writing, though? Uh, there is in me, definitely. For me, writing is a kind of therapy. Uh, it's a way of understanding problems and, through understanding, making them less powerful and less confusing and paranoid-inducing. And hopefully, for the reader, um, it will have a similar kind of effect. You're interested in the spread of ideas. How do you think ideas can best be communicated? I'm struck by the way that there are loads of very good ideas in the world, but they don't often get much airtime, literally. Um, if, you, if you look at what's on the mass media and compare it to the great ideas that are somewhere in the ether, you'll find that um, the great ideas are suffering. And my goal is to try, in a very modest way, because I'm just one person, but to try and uh, help the most important ideas to get a bit more airtime. How do you get the balance right? How does one get the balance right between thinking and acting, between thought and action? Um, I think the, 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 you know, the real trick is to make sure that when you're acting, you're guided by the best possible ideas. Most of us, when we act, we're in a rush, we haven't thought things through. And you know, the goal of thinkers in society are to act as places, almost like sort of monastic havens, where people who normally have to act and don't have much time to reflect on it can kind of come and immerse themselves in thought and get a bit of guidance. How often do you actually come across truly original contemporary thought? Um, contemporary thoughts, you know, some of them are great. I think, you know, a lot of the most interesting thinking is not so much brand new as an interesting restatement or recasting of an old truth that is very important but that we lose sight of. You know, rather than focusing always on the new, I think a lot of you know, the art of living is about keeping in mind things that we theoretically know but practically forget. On a day-to-day -day basis, do you enjoy the art of conversation and of dialogue and of debate? Yes, I mean, I think to be in a kind of community where you can raise really big issues is a uh, you know, great privilege and I, I love doing that. We've talked about reading, not entirely in a positive light, but how can we get more from our reading if we do read? I think the point of reading is to help you to live. It's not to pass an exam. It's not to sound clever. It's to get something out of it that you can use. And my goal as a writer is to try and prompt my reader towards what could broadly be called self-help. Now, that's a very pejorative term, but a very important one. We should be reading to help ourselves and help our societies. I don't believe in knowledge that's abstract and... Um, simply made to impress. I believe in knowledge that can be practical and that can bring us, in a broader sense, happiness. How do you get your guidance on morality, on what's right and what's wrong? Um, it's not hard. You know, I think we all have a moral sense. The problem with the moral sense is that it gets squashed and pulled in other directions. We tend, to, all of us, have a very intuitive sense. And I think, again, literature and art has a role in reminding us to do what we know is good but very often doesn't seem so glamorous and exciting or, or, or possible when we're up against it. What to you is the ideal form of government? The ideal form of government is an enlightened government which doesn't have a problem with trying to teach people how to live. We've got a terrible fear of the word paternalism. I actually believe in paternalistic government. We need 
uh, the right sort of government that can actually teach us you know, how to lead our lives. This is not a taboo situation. When you're not thinking and writing, five seconds, what do you do? Um, playing with my kids and planning the next book at the back of my head while doing some Lego. <laughs> right, there we are. Doing some Lego. Yeah. It's really nice to meet you. Very nice to meet you. Thank you.